Okay, welcome everyone to our distinguished lecture series. I'm very excited to introduce our distinguished speaker, Franz Koshak, who is the Charles Piper Professor in the ECS department at MIT and is also a member of CISEL. Uh, Franz co leads the Parallel and Distributed Operating System Group in MIT, where he works in systems in general, <coughs> including operating systems, uh, networking, program languages, etc. And uh, as many of you know, Franz has, has, has had such an illustrious career and he's won so many awards that we probably cannot name even all of them here. And I'm just going to try to name a few. He's won the ACM SIGOPS uh, Mark Weiser Award. I believe that he was actually the first one to win the award. He's an ACM fellow. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering, a member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, etc., etc. But there's one more statistics that is really interesting, and I think I'm going to share that with you because it will demonstrate the quality of work that uh, France does. A few years ago, uh, Ramsey Arpachi Duso from University of Wisconsin put together a list called the system's top 50. And basically what he did, he counted the number of SOSP, OSDI papers that every researcher had published, which is arguably the best uh, systems conferences that we had. And unsurprisingly, France was number one with 24 papers. And I counted, actually, it's not 28. I think many of them have been best papers. So that's one of the <coughs> reasons we're very excited to have him uh, today. With, and with that, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming France Kasha. Thank you very much for this very kind board. You know, and of course, all credit is to my students, correct? And you know, they, they do really the hard work. Uh, so I want to, um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I appreciate the fact that you're all coming out on first day. I understand normally these talks are on Friday, uh, uh, but, uh, so I appreciate you coming out uh, today. What I want to do uh, is I'm not going to talk about the 28 OSDI or SSP papers that I've written <laughs> in the past. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about the most recent project that is currently active and ongoing. Um, and that project is about certifying a file system. And so the, the goal here is to come up with a file system that has a mathematical proof that, that actually is correct. And the particular correctness property that we want to focus on is the crashes. You know, in the, we want correctness in the presence of crashes. And this is joint work with a number of uh, grad students and undergrads, as well as two of my colleagues, Adam Chipala, who's a person in verification of programming languages, and Nikolai Zelovich. Um, so, just to motivate this work a little bit, um, file systems are very complex. Uh, you know, the ext 4 file system is about you know, 60,000 lines of code, and uh, file systems actually have bugs. <coughs> in fact, you know, they're parts of the so you know, have a career, uh, or make a career out of sort of finding bugs in file systems. In fact, this graph is partially generated from a uh, paper that they published, or data for a paper that they published. And if you can see in this graph, you know, years on the uh, x-axis, number of patches on the y-axis, and these are patches to the, you know, the Git patches that actually fix bugs. You know, so these are not all uh, patches uh, to the file system, but just the patches that fix bugs. And even for a file system like ext 3 which you know, is a mature, you know, well, many of you probably use, anybody, probably most of you that use Linux use actually an ext 3 or ext 4 file system, uh, have bugs. And even uh, in, in, in the file system is that mature. But ext 4 is by far not the only file system that, for example, Linux has. In fact, you know, there are many file systems uh, the, the typical operating system have, and this, you know, not unsurprisingly, all of them have bugs. <laughs> um, and what is interesting is that, of course, many of these bugs are not that important, or you know, they're annoying. It's too bad they're there, but you know, that they don't really have big impact. But it's not true for all of them. Some of them do actually have serious uh, effects. You know, one of them, some of them can lead to data loss. Correct? If the power fails at an inopportune time, the file system might not come back correctly, and that some data gets lost. Uh, there might be security effects. You know, what happens is that you know, data from an old file, you know, blocks from an old file show up in the blocks from a new file, and they still contain the same content. And that way, data can be leaked. And so some of these bugs are actually quite serious. Uh, so uh, this motivated, or this general you know, the idea, is motivated us to think about like, how you know, to avoid you know, bugs in file systems. And clearly, we're not the first to notice that there are bugs in file systems. And there's quite a bit of work in the past on fixing bugs in file systems. And they fall out roughly in two categories. There's the uh, work that basically is about finding bugs and basically reducing the number of bugs using either symbolic execution or you know, program analysis. And you know, that, that, actually that work has been highly effective. I mean, they find bugs, you know, the Linux people or like any operating system person community uh, fixes them. But, but in the end, what they do, they reduce the number of bugs. They don't really eliminate them, right? And there's always a possibility that there's still more bugs uh, possible. And so there has been some work, but much less work, in the area of uh, you know, basically trying to eliminate bugs by proving, uh, which is where this FCQ work or our, this the talk falls into. Uh, but most of that work are, is actually incomplete <coughs> file systems. 
and almost none of them actually deal with crashes. And uh, so the focus here in this talk is about crashes. And the reason I'm focusing on uh, crashes is because it's sort of the crucial part of a file system. The reason you have a file system is because you want to store your data permanently, and when the power fails or the power comes back up, you know, you would love to be the case that your, uh, your data is still there. And so and the, the challenge with crashes is that they expose partial state of a file system. So let's say your file system operation requires a bunch of disk writes. If a power fails, you're just in the between some you know, two disk writes. That might be just an inopportune time uh, that you know, the, the data can get lost. And so it's for a file system developer, has to carefully reason about any particular two points where a crash can happen to understand whether the code actually is correct. And you know, you use a little bit of a fragment of code or comments out of the Linux you know, kernel where there's a whole discussion on, well, if we do the sync right now you know, between these two writes, then we're guaranteed that everything will work out correctly even if we failed at this particular point in time. And so there's a lot of careful analysis necessary to do, to do this kind of uh, stuff. Um, and, you know, the, and it's not just, you know, in these, in these, so it's not just actually preserving you know, the, your actually, the content of your files, uh, another sort of class of problems that always shows up is that uh, the file system actually should preserve you know, the security uh, after a crash. And it's not uncommon that, you know, as I said before, where an old file that contains some user A blocks you know, shows up in you know, user B's file, and suddenly user B can actually read user A files because the blocks got reused. And in fact, there was a bug in, uh, in Linux uh, that was introduced in 2008. You know, if you mount the file, EXD4 files in the two options, namely the checksum option to get better performance, as well as um, direct data writes, then a bug like that can exactly happen. And in fact, the developers didn't realize that until 2014. So the bug was there for six years before they discovered that actually they had this you know, secure, basically security exploit. Uh, and it's very subtle. And again, it has to do with exact reasoning about you know, when a failure happens and what, at what time. So, our goal was to say, like, well, let's uh, see if we, and this was really uh, you know, exercise in certification, our goal was to basically build a file system that actually has a machine checkable proof, uh, that the implementation meets the specification, uh, under normal execution, and under any sequence of crashes, including crashes during recovery. You know, because when the recovery procedure you might run, you might fail again. And you know, might make a reason that, that, that you don't have any, any problems there either. Um, and the reason we got into this is because you know, it seemed to us that you know, the verification community and the PL community had made so much progress that it actually might be possible to actually take a, something of the complexity of a file system and try to see if you can prove it correct. Uh, and I had no background in verification you know, before sort of getting really into this seriously. Uh, and in fact, we managed to, you know, to build a file system that is you know, where we can certify that it actually is crash safe. And so no matter when a failure happens, you know, we, our proof you know, basically shows that you know, the file system will recover in the correct state. Um, so and there's two key parts you know, to this project. Uh, and, uh, one is you know, a design or a way of reasoning, a framework that allows you to reason about crashes, which we call the crash war logic. It's an extension of war logic. And the second part actually is an actual file system, right, uh, which is FCQ. And FCQ is a very simple file system. So it's not at the same complexity of ext 4 yet. Uh, but it is of the complexity of like a you know, 90s, 70s, 90s, 80s file system. You know, think version 7 Unix or something like that. Uh, so it has a lot of the Unix system calls, like read write, you know, many, many, uh, many of the standard system calls. Uh, but it also has some simplifications. For example, it's not parallel. You know, actually, we only can run in a Unix processor. It also doesn't have any symbolic links. Uh, but other than that, you know, it's sort of like a standard Unix file system. Uh, in total effort, you know, for us, you know, to you know to do, you know, to prove this. Uh, you know, it was about one and a half years of work, you know, about a team, four, five people, in term, and, and that includes learning uh, the verification uh, system that we're using, which is COC. Uh, I didn't know anything about COC until, well, I knew about COC, but I hadn't used it, you know, before actually doing this project. And so to make it a little bit more concrete, uh, you know, what it actually is that we did. Uh, so there's two pieces that we developed. One is this crash horror logic, and the second piece is this SSQ, which is the file system. And the crash horror logic is you can think about it as a specification language. You know, it's a specification language to actually reason about crashes. And so on the FCQ side, what we do is you know, we write specifications for the external file system interface as well as the internal, uh, file, in internal file system interface using the crash horror logic. Uh, we implement a file system. And then we prove you know, that the implementation actually obeys the specification. Right? And so 
the SQ development effort is a three pieces, basically the specification, actually writing the file system itself, and then the proving. And a lot of the action really turns out to be it's actually in the specification part. That's for us, where the most complexity uh, was. And once you've done this, you know, once you write the program, the specification to proof, then actually COC can just check the proof for you. So it's, you know, uh, uh, it's a machine checkable proof. It can basically tell you, yes, you know, your program actually meets the specification. Uh, one interesting piece uh, is, is that COC provides is actually it allows you to extract a program. Uh, you, so you can take the program that was written inside of you know, COC and you can extract it to Haskell. Uh, there's an OCaml backend too, but when we extract it to Haskell, and then you can link that Haskell code, for example, with the Fuse uh, file system library that, you know, that Haskell has. And actually, then you can run the whole thing as a user level server on top of Linux. And so, in fact, you know, our file system is basically a file server running on top of Linux. And basically, it runs all the standard Unix programs, like move, git, make, and all that kind of stuff. And because what happens, of course, when you run these move gits, and then the Fuse live kernel uh, redirects all those system calls you know, to the Fuse library, and the Fuse library then serves them up to our file server with, you know, uh, that's then extracted to Haskell. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so to give you a little bit of a feel for uh, how this all works out, uh, let me actually demo the file system to you to actually show that actually a real file system. So here I have a disk, <laughs> and this actually has an FSQ file system on it. And I guess I also have to show up some meeting. Second, so let me uh, start with a virtual machine. And it runs Linux, uh, and I can stick it in the disk. And then, ah, uh, shoot, let me actually. Uh, I use the port next, and it doesn't fit next to the. I don't this out. Let's see if that actually happens. So I can just mount you know, the file, this USB disk as a file server on uh, Linux, and hopefully something good happens. Uh, of course, you will see that just the one time I want to do this, it doesn't work. Uh, that might have been, God, it's proven to be correct. So, you know, how long is this file? <laughs> Maybe because I just switched, I pulled out this other USB uh, device. Uh, that was probably not so smart of me. Uh, actually, what I'm talking about, we're working perfect. Here's the, I put some files actually on it. Uh, and as a, for example, I put it on the, uh, so I'm CD into the file system. Uh, there's a repository for XV6, which is a, a teaching operating system that we build at MIT, which has a file system inside of it. And actually, the FSQ file system is very modeled on the uh, XV6 file system. So there's a bunch of code in there, and I can just call make and uh, compile it. And what I'm going to do is simulate a crash. And then the way I'm going to simulate the crash is by pulling out the USB stick. Right? So I'm going to run make, and then well, it's not fast enough, we can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> While I was doing it, you know, there's a lot of writes to this disk uh, happening, correct? And, you know, you'll see that the file system is slightly unhappy at this point. Uh, so I can stick it back in. Go to Linux. For good measure, I'll kill the file system and mount it again. And i got to go back. And hopefully, there's still a repo. That's good. And there's xv6, q2, maybe there's some .o files here, and there's some .o files too that we just made. Right? So you know, at least in this one scenario, this one crash scenario, the file system actually is still intact. Right? And so you know, the question that you might ever want to ask is, you know, wh what is the general story, correct? Like, you know, what you would like to know is like, in any crash case, correct, actually the right, the right thing will happen. And so the first question to answer is like, what is the right thing? You know, what does it mean to be correct? Uh, and this is actually something that we uh, specify, you know, struggle with quite a bit with, uh, in, which is like how to specify <coughs> what correct is. And so the first thing you might think uh, is like, well, we will look this up in the POSIX, uh, in the Unix standards, correct? POSIX is a Unix standard that says like what the file system is supposed to do. Uh, and since file system has been around, you might have uh, expected that uh, the standard says something. Well, here's what the POSIX standard says about power failures uh, and failure crashes in general. The power failure can cause data to be lost. <laughs> 
Uh, the data may be associated with a file that's still open, with one that has been closed, with a directory, or with any other internal storage data structures associated with permanent storage. This data can be lost uh, in a whole or part, so the only careful inspection of file contents can determine what actually the right operation happens. So, you know, this doesn't help you much, right, in terms of figuring out, like, what the right behavior is. And, uh, and I should say, this is uh, not a criticism, criticism of POSIX, because the, the whole goal of POSIX actually was to find a common denominator between file systems and say, like, well, at least in these common denominator, they agree. And it turns out that crash handling is one of the areas where file systems generally don't agree. And so it's not actually very well specified. And in fact, this has been a source you know, for, uh, for problems for application writers, because application writers expect, you know, application writers on databases that want strong properties on their crash. And the crashes, you know, try to want to assume properties about the file system. Many file systems provide slightly different, you know, properties. And it's not uncommon that, like, one database that runs perfectly on one file system basically loses data on another file system because, you know, they cheat or they do slightly different uh, handling recovery. So short story short, you know, the, the long story short is basically there's no specification. Um, so uh, the first thing we said, like, well, we'll keep a simple specification because we don't really, you know, we're not verification experts. Let's we'll first see if we can build a file system that actually has a reasonable, clear specification about what actually it means to be correct in the failures. And so what we did is, uh, as a starting point, we said, like, okay, well, we're going to run every system call as a transaction. And so if a system call, a file system call makes a lot of modifications, we're going to bundle up all those transactions in, all those modifications in a single transaction. And then the standard rules apply, right? That all the operations are happen, or none of the operations happen, right? And so the way you implement that is using the standard database technology of the write-ahead log. Instead of actually updating the file data system data structure directly in disk, you put the updates first in the log, you commit, and then you apply all the updates from the log to the actual disk. And that way, like, if you fail in the middle, right, you can just either roll back the log or roll forward, depending exactly what kind of write-ahead logging scheme you actually implement. And so, uh, so that's sort of the approach that we took. We were bundling all the system calls up into a system call of a transaction. Um, now, then the question becomes really how, how to specify, you know, if, uh, the create system call, right, with this sort of this transactional semantics in a way you know, that we can actually reason about it formally and actually then prove that an implementation meets that particular specification. Uh, and the second thing is that, you know, how do we reason about recovery? Because if, you know, a failure happens, then there is some, you know, after the failure happens, the file system comes up and presumably, you know, it's going to do the replay of the right, of the right ahead log. And we need to argue and reason about like whether actually the recovery procedure that actually redoes the right ahead log actually is correct too, right, and the failures. And so we have to think about how do we sort of fit in the recovery semantics inside, you know, in this procedure too. Does so, all make sense so far? Good. Um, yeah, you feel free to ask me questions anytime. Uh, and and if, particularly if you disagree with something, you should also point it out. You know, this is the favorite thing to do at MIT is to say like, oh, no, you're wrong, all wrong. And so uh, you won't, you know, won't, won't offend me if you ask uh, uh, tough questions. Um, and so don't, don't hesitate. It's also fine to ask easy questions. I'm not against that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. give, give an easy question. <laughs> the log also go, goes to disk. Yeah. But how do you know the file system of the log is safe? So we're actually, well, you'll, I'll come talk about it in a second. Uh, in fact, in the, the next uh, call is about disk write. Um, and so I'll tell you uh, exactly what it is. But basically, what we assume there's a, you know, a, we have a low level disk interface. Uh, disk write is one of them, and I'll specify exactly what we assume from it. Uh, and we build everything on top of that. Uh, so there's some things that we're going to assume from the disk, and I'm actually going to state them right now. So the general approach that we take to actually write these specifications is uh, OR logic. And just remind you uh, what OR logic is, correct? The general idea is that uh, you have a precondition. It's a program that you want to run, and then you know, the, the, if you know, your program is correct, then basically it should establish the post condition uh, that you write down. Right? And so when you uh, prove for which in terms of OR logic, you, know, you can assume that the precondition is true, and then you have to prove that your code actually establish, establishes a post condition given the precondition. And so, for example, you could write uh, a spec, a horse spec for disk write, you know, the, the low level or function that actually writes to the disk. And it might have something of the following form where you know, there's an address and a value that you write. And the precondition is the address, you know, or the block, you know, contains the old value. And in the post condition, actually, it would say, you know, the block contains the new value. Right? Unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about crashes. Right? What happens if during this disk write you fail? And, uh, and so this do give the slightly different semantics, but on the level of a sector, it's typically the case that uh, there's a crash condition. Yeah, right. For the disk write, do you really need a precondition? Uh, well, let me hold, hold on. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that. It will be clear why that is so useful. Uh, 
uh, the example that will show up here right away in the crash condition. Uh, so what we did, we extended the more logic with this third condition. So there's a precondition, postcondition, and the crash condition. And for everything that we write down, we also have to write down the crash condition. So we're actually forcing a little bit more work on the spec writer. But the crash condition states like what actually the property of the system is after the crash, or actually right before the crash. So in this case, you know, basically the crash condition says that the disk is actually in the old state or in the new state, at least for this particular sector. And so we're assuming this basically, is, this specification basically implicitly says that uh, sector rights are atomic. You know, they have an all or nothing and no intermediate. Furthermore, we're going to assume for the rest of the talk there's no data corruption. You know, clearly, you could write more sophisticated specs that might capture you know, th these other properties too. But for uh, you know, simplicity you know, of explanation, we're going to sort of run with this, uh, this specification, which is pretty standard for most uh, disks. We're going to modify it slightly because there's one important thing that we want to do, which is what we want to formalize asynchronous disk I.O. Uh, you know, it is the case when you're on a write to the disk, actually the disk doesn't put it really on the solid state or the disk platter immediately, instead it has an internal buffer. And the reason it does that is to get much more higher disk throughput, right? And so if you want to flush something you know, to the disk, you actually have to, in addition to a write, you have to addition a sync or a write barrier to actually flush data to the disk. And so we want to capture that because we, in the end we want a reasonable high performance file system, right? And this is a standard optimization that people do. And, so the, you know, and here you can see that like all the actions is always in the specification part. The way we specify that is with something what we call value sets. The value sets are just a tuple where the, tuple, the first element of the tuple is the last written value or the last written value issued to the disk. And the, the second part of the tuple is a set, which is all the previous ri values written to the disk before or after the last sync or the last barrier. Right? And so the precondition then for our operation is, well, the, the last value written to this must be V0 because you know, if we do a read, that's what we're going to get back. And then there's a bunch of other values that we've written in the past, but we haven't issued the barrier yet. The Bose condition is that, well, this, the last value written is going to be our V that we wrote, and the, uh, the, the value set is going to be the old block that was there plus all the previous block that we've written there, or our previous value. And the crash condition is going to be either the old value set or the new value set as before. Right? Um, and so this captures, you know, this specification captures this async and this disk I.O. Uh, and basically what the barrier or the disk sync operation does, it basically sets, you know, the, it actually captures the fact that, that when you do a sync, then the last value written is actually the last value written is V0. And th there's no outstanding values anymore, it's just nil. Right? And so if you do a sync operation, you come back up, you're guaranteed that if you do a read, you're going to get the V0. Now, in the case of a crash, uh, and our recovery semantics, the way we specify the recovery semantic is, is the case that any value from the value set could be the one on the disk. And so you don't know. The only thing you know is that one of these values is the value that might be on the disk. Right? And so uh, in the recovery procedures, we have to reason about you know, these value sets and uh, argue that, you know, or prove that basically no matter where, what is actually the value set, that actually the right, you know, that the right thing will happen in the file system. All right? That makes sense. Yeah. One quick. So now the crash condition says that it can be either the precondition or the post condition, right? But yeah. you were mentioning that the crash condition says that it can be any of those values. So how is that captured? In this I guess case? so. Yeah. So this is a good question. So what typically what we do, and uh, we find it useful to write the crash condition as the condition right before the crash happened. Uh, and the reason we and I'll show up later why this is useful. The reason the reason is useful is because. You know, the crash conditions are very similar to the pre and post conditions. And in fact, <coughs> in more complicated specifications, we will reuse functions that are used in the pre condition we use in the crash condition. So that's one reason. Then at recovery time, you know, basically after recovery, you know, the crash condition turns into something different. It actually turns to a tuple of this form where V0, instead of V being the last written value, it could be any one of them in the value set. Okay. Okay, so, uh, and so we have three basically disk operations returning to your question, which is like a disk read, a disk sync, and a disk write. And they basically have you know, specs like this. Uh, in most cases, simpler than write. Write is probably the most co uh, complex one. And we basically assume those as axioms of our system. You know, like they are the truth, you know, and we don't actually go off and prove. And then everything on top of that, we, we build and we prove you know, based on this, you know, spec these axiomatics uh, specifications. Okay? And so it's very important to sort of convince yourself that the specification is reasonable because we actually don't really prove them. All right. So, uh, of course, you don't want to certify much more complex operations than just this read and write. And so we're going to just give you a little bit of an example of this. You know, this is a function that sits inside the file system, a BMAP, that you know, takes an inode number, a block number, and then returns 
you know, the physical block number that corresponds to the block number within that particular I node. And the way it does that in Unix is typically, you know, you look at the, there's a number I nodes that are mapped directly, so you look at the block number, is it directly mapped, then uh, is it bigger than the direct map, then you have to read the indirect block from the disk, and then in, look at the indirect block for actually the physical block number that matches to this particular DNOM and return it. And otherwise you return the real, the, the thing that actually is in the I node. And so for every function uh, in our file system, we have a precondition, a postcondition, and a crash condition. Uh, and so we uh, have to write them down. And in, in most cases, you know, this is uh, not too complicated. And we have to prove right, that these pre and post condition hold. And the way we do that is a standard HOR style. You know, we will use the, uh, the control flow uh, graph or the control flow of the uh, procedure to actually reason about you know, the properties of this uh, call. Right? And as you probably remember from HOR logic is that you know, in the case of like an if statement, there's a rule about like, you know, how you prove an if statement correct. And basically it says, like, you know, in the if case, you know, there's going to be some post condition that has to imply the precondition of the else in the, the, the true case. And similarly, you know, in the false case, you know, we have to uh, prove that the post condition of the false case implies the precondition of the, the, the false branch. Right? And, and, this is the, and you work this through uh, in the standard whole logic uh, case. Now, what is nice about this, uh, this very stylized way of writing these specifications using this pre and post condition crash condition is this can be for a large part uh, automated because it's always the case that the post condition must imply the precondition, the, you know, the post condition then the next guy implies the precondition. And we can just look at the control flow graph, and you know we wrote you know internal you know uh, code inside of COP to basically do a lot of this chaining of pre and post conditions automatically. And since they often are raising at the same level of abstraction, that can often be done uh, pretty easily. Uh, the crash conditions also can be automated to a large degree because basically the crash condition of one of these uh, more complex operations is basically the union of any crash condition that actually any of the components has, right? If we can fail a long read, then that is a one possible crash condition. If we fail in the return, that'd be another you know, crash condition, right? And so we can just unionize all the uh, crash condition. So there's not a lot of proving to have to be d done there either. It's just like, you know, take the or. You know, it's the easiest thing to prove um, uh, possible. A lot of the action, though, is on the proving work, is on the boundaries between the, uh, you know, the action, the post condition of the, the return to the post condition of the function because often you change abstraction levels. You might here run reason about disk blocks, but in here you might be running a reason about I nodes, and you basically have to prove that you know the reasoning are, you did on the level of I on the disk blocks actually indeed implies this post condition that is stated in terms of an I node. Uh, and the way you know these uh, things typically happen is you know the way we capture these higher level invariants is using representation functions. Uh, and so, for example, here is a little bit more complicated function, log write. So this is a function that writes a disk block value into the log. It's supposed to be directly in the final location. Uh, and, you know, it has a, if I walk you through the specification, uh, you know, it says, first of all, you know, there's a representation function, the log rep function. It basically says, uh, we're running this, and the precondition is that, you know, this is actually an active transaction. So we're inside of a transaction. Uh, the transaction started in some start state. And we're currently in the, the old state for this particular transaction at the point that we called you know, disk write. And the way to think about log rep is it's, a, it's sort of a macro that expands in a lot of these points to relationships. You know, so I earlier showed you like you know, a points to v. Well, basically what this is is a, uh, a macro that expands with lots of points to relationships. So for example, it will say that the commit block is zero because the transaction is not committed yet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So uh, just think about it as a collection of points to relationships. The other thing that actually says is that in the, given this old state, whatever the old state is, in that old state, A is actually pointing to B0. Yeah, so this captures this notion that uh, you know, we're actually uh, pointing to some value. Now, the post condition is very similar. It is an act, still an active transaction. Uh, it's still started in the same start state as the original transaction started in, but now it may have reaches a new state, namely you know, the application of log write. Uh, and in a new state, you know, A is pointing to V. Uh, and then the crash condition actually is pretty trivial. You know, like the crash condition is pretty trivial. It basically says, you know, we can crash, and we can crash during an active transaction that started in some start state, and it might have crashed in any state, you know, that actually happened here you know, during the set of transactions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm a little confused. So, so uh, you mentioned the high-level function in the previous slide, yep. and then there is basically block-level functions. Is your log done at the only block level, or are you also having, having higher-level logs? 
Uh, we are, there's this whole concept of multi-level recovery and multi-level logging. I got so, so, so think about that. that. We're going to do a single log. That is, and this, this file system has a single log, you know, a journal that where we basically write down all the operations in. But at the pH level or at the, the disk block level, or is it at the? It's a, a physical journal. It's a physical, physical journal. journal. Exactly. Which is typically where these file systems work at that level. So point. idempotence is easy. So you yep. you feel I'll show you in a second how idempotence is done. Uh, you have like Linux in internal in the Linux log is also a, a physical log, a physical journal. So maybe it's a late question for later because this seems like a completely reasonable application for multi-level recovery. So I would love mm -hmm. to hear your thought on this. So in fact, we do actually you know, uh, do multiple level recovery. I'll talk maybe in a second a little bit later about it, where you know, the application might have to do its own recovery and dust it in top of the, the existing uh, recovery system. And we can prove those things correct, too. Um, OK, so this is the, sort of the, the representation function. A lot of the action is actually proving you know, these representation functions hold after some you know, operation that happened. So, for example, we modify the file system tree. We have to demonstrate that the file system tree is still a tree, right? Uh, so, this will give you a little bit of a flavor of like how you know we can specify a complete system call. You know, here's our <coughs> example of the create system call again. Uh, and again, we have you know, uh, so the create system call stage in, in this particular case, a direct, uh, an inode number that actually represents the directory inside of which we are going to create the path name or the file name for fn. And as you can see, you know, the disk logs you know, still says the same, has this no transaction. Uh, basically says, okay, this is system calls. Remember that every system call is run as a single transaction. And so the, the, this is the beginning of the transaction, says there was no transaction, and, and we're starting in the start state. The start state contains of a tree, and there's a representation uh, a function that actually captures what the tree is. And, and it's the case that there's a path that actually uh, corresponds to the path that actually allows you to get to the directory inode. And then there's no file name of the name that we want to create in that particular directory. And so that's a precondition. And so this gives you, you know, the precondition of the create function. The post condition is no surprise. Right? It says like there's no, uh, we're in a, a rep the, the log is now in a state where there's no transaction, but we are in the new state. So we moved to, to successfully creating uh, the, 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 the file. And in fact, you know, the description of the new file, the new tree is as follows. There's a new tree, and the new tree contains, you know, there's an update of the old tree with, you know, the, uh, the file name added, you know, to the directory tree, right? And so this gives you uh, the pre and post condition if there are no failures. And then if there's a failure, there's going to be, you know, there's a description of what happens in the failure. And here's a very precise description. It's either, you know, there's no transaction and we're starting in the start state, so nothing really happened. Or we actually successfully executed the whole function. Basically, we crashed after the commit point. You know, so everything is done. Or we crashed somewhere in between. And there's uh, two cases. One is you know, we're just basically part of an actual transaction. And we're started, but we're somewhere in some state you know, because there's a whole sequence of writes that create us. Or we actually commit it, but we haven't applied you know, the, commit, the, the log entries to actually define the location. Okay, those are the four cases in which create can actually crash. So this gives you a complete you know, description, basically, of you know, the create system call, correct? A lot more precise than POSIX. Uh, it has a you know, basically mathematical description, actually, of what actually this function of the system call does. So now we're going to log recovery. Uh, so that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so are these, each of these calls, are they serialized? So if I have multiple of them? Yeah, and our current file system is completely sequential. That's why I said there was no parallelism at all. And so you do one transaction, then the next one, then the next one. Uh, clearly, concurrency is, uh, I'll come back to that at the end. Let me, uh, but that, that's an open problem. Um, okay, so log recovery. Uh, so we have to, you know, so far this was all about, okay, well, we run a transaction, you know, either succeeds or it fails. But then what happens on the recovery? Right? We have to incorporate this notion of recovery in some way in our logic so that we can reason about it. Um, and so the, First of all, you know, the spec for the log recovery function is as follows, uh, which is, it says that, you know, the precondition is you know, there was some log that was in some you know, correct state in the sense that you know, it actually is a valid log. That's all that it basically says. The post condition says uh, we either you know, commit to the, uh, if, we, if the recovery successfully happened, we either end up in the original state you know, before actually we did any transaction, or we end up in the committed state, one of the two. Uh, the crash condition is there's still a valid log on disk. And so and if you think about this for a second, so if we crash during recovery, the, there's all the thing that we, the, the, the crash can says, well, the log is still valid. And that's because you know, we're not going to modify it, presumably. And what's interesting about this crash condition correct, is implies you know, the precondition. And so that means that we can actually run log recovery over and over and over. 
uh, because it's an idempotent operation. Right? It's always valid to actually execute log recovery again because its precondition actually is equal to the, the crash condition. Uh, so, of course, you know, we have to prove that our log recovery obeys this particular specification, and we, which we have done, but this gives you a little bit of sense about like, you know, how, that, you know, how, how the different pieces fit together. So, uh, to say a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, we can combine basically this create system call and the log recovery function, and we do that using our recovery semantics, and we specify the behavior of sort of including recovery in our uh, file system as follows. So here's our same story as before, just the create system call. So the crash, the specification basically says precondition the same, postcondition the same. And the only thing it says, like on crash, always run log recovery. And, um, and then we have a recovery state that corresponds to the case when actually the recovery uh, successfully succeeds. And as you can see, there's basically two cases, either the transaction uh, succeeded or the transaction didn't succeed at all. Right? And so this gives you a particular, a very precise uh, specification of create, including recovery. It's important, you know, one thing that's interesting is that we decided to actually split the recovery from the post uh, case. And the reason that is the case is because the post case can actually guarantee stronger properties than recovery could, right? Because actually the post case might actually return values or could actually return the thing just succeeded, period. Well, the recovery function can only say, well, it might have succeeded or might not have succeeded. And of course, for the application using this function, that might not be you know, sufficient. Does that all make sense? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I understand that the logs uh, protect your file system operations. Yeah. Um, but then what protects the log? Because we are at the file system level. So even log operations themselves are file system operations. Uh, you know, the lock operations are disk read and write operations. In the end, everything boils down to disk write or disk read. And you can easily see how we can actually maintain this log intact, for example, property by just proving that there's actually no writes to the, to the log during recovery. Like the only writes that happen actually are to the data part of the disk, not to the log part of the disk. And so that's sort of the key intuition why actually it's pretty easy to prove that log recovery actually is idempotent and actually obeys this log intact property. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, you know, going through the full recovery code would be too much work to describe in a single talk, and I'd be happy to do so, but, you know, I'm not sure you would be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much did you guys change the design and implementation of the file system from what you would have otherwise done to make the proof simpler? Well, well hold that's you know, two slides ahead of me. Okay. Uh, um, okay, so I think yeah, I covered this. Okay, so just to sort of summarize on the, sort of the, uh, the, the crash horror logic piece. Um, so we basically extend the horror logic with two ideas. One is crash condition, and one is the recovery semantics business. Uh, and the benefit of you know, this crash horror logic is that it allows us very precisely to reason about crashes, as, you know, as I've sort of demonstrated. Um, and it actually allows for a lot of automation because of the sort of stylized way in which you write all these uh, specifications. Um, now, there is a cost to it, uh, as I wanted to point out, which is like you have to write down these crash conditions. So every function, everything in our file system actually has a crash condition. Now, the good news is that at least above the logging layer, not below the logging layer, but above the logging layer, the crash condition tends to be very simple. The only the crash condition basically is log is intact. And it's the only thing that basically, you know, the crash condition. But inside the logging layer, we have to reason very carefully about the crash conditions, and it's very, you know, it has to be very precisely done. Um, so, to return to your uh, question, uh, so we, we're using this specification language uh, in, uh, you know, and actually then we implemented the file system and specify it correct. Right? And the file system, uh, it's a, as I said, is modeled on XV6, which is this teaching operating system that we use at MIT and also outside of, used outside of MIT. And it contains, you know, it's a typical Unix file system. So it has a file system cache, it has a directory tree, it has directories and byte files, block files, inodes, bitmap allocators, write ahead log, and a buffer cache. Um, no parallelism, so there's no locking or anything. Uh, we are going to assume that every you know, system call runs one by one. Uh, our main goal uh, in uh, implementing this was actually to figure out how to reduce the proof effort. Uh, and so uh, the, the things that we, we did, a couple things that we did. Uh, one, uh, we have one allocator. Uh, so most file systems have a separate allocator for inodes and one for blocks. We actually have one allocator. We proved the allocator once correct, and then we can use it in a bunch of different places. And we did some trickiness to actually get a very good allocator to actually make this work. And we also made the allocator not particularly sophisticated. In fact, it's pretty slow. Uh, but you know, it's proven to be correct. Uh, then, in addition, 
inside of the file systems, you know, much more precise about the inter interfaces between the different layers than you know, in a typical file system. In a typical file system, like some layer will, you know, poke you know, three layers down to read some bit. Uh, you know, in FSQ, that doesn't happen because then you can't prove things correctly. So it's a very carefully structured uh, file system. And then finally, of course, we cheated a little bit because we have simpler specification. Uh, you know, we actually don't support symbolic links, you know, which makes our proving life a lot easier because a tree is a tree. And, you know, not, uh, and not, you know, doesn't have any, uh, not a graph. Uh, which, you know, when we talk about directory tree in Unix, that's incorrect and generally correct, but it is not a tree exactly a graph. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a couple questions we wanted to answer because the, the whole goal of this project right, was to actually, uh, you know, avoid bugs. And uh, so the, there's a couple questions that we wanted to answer. One is, uh, you know, what bugs does actually FCQ eliminate? You know these proofs. You know what, how good are they? And what? what uh, 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 second is how much development effort was it actually in the end? And how well does FCQ perform? You know you might wonder. Uh, well, maybe we make too much simplifications to actually you know, get decent performance. And so, first of all, uh, this is not new for people in the verification community, but at least for uh, for a systems version like me, this was a complete new experience. Uh, we wrote the file system, we proved it correct, and then it worked. Uh, you know, we ran a whole bunch of tests, and they all passed. <laughs> There's no bugs to fix hell at all. Uh, and so the testing part of this, you know, project was very, very short. Um, we uh, run the Linux stress file system trust, uh, uh, FS stress on our, uh, uh, our on our file system, and we had uh, we had one bug. And, you know, one bug was actually in the specification, not actually in our implementation. Uh, we forgot that, like, if you extend the file beyond its length, you actually have to zero fill it, and we didn't do that. Uh, so we fixed that, and then we passed all the tests uh, without any problems. Um, and so uh, the other thing that we did is we looked at all these file bug patches that uh, you can extract from the uh, Linux Git sources and sort of classified them in different categories. And then, you know, sort of qualitatively analyzed whether actually uh, FSQ basically uh, avoids these bugs. And so, you know, for example, uh, violation of directory or violation of directory invariants. You know, for example, the link counts have to add up. Uh, and you know, there are bugs in the Linux file system where the link counts actually don't add up in certain cases. And this is completely impossible in FCQ because you know, we proved right, that the, the file system is always a correct tree. Uh, uh, and so th these bugs can happen. Similarly, in our corner cases, like for example, you know, rename could actually in Linux in fail in incorrectly in one direction when you ran out of memory. And again, you know, we, our proofs basically demonstrate that you can, you know, that cannot happen. We handled that case correctly. There are also some things that we don't really do, you know, score 100 percent on. So, for example, we actually didn't pay much attention to the er uh, uh, error codes, and so in some cases we had gen generate a general error code instead of very specific error code. So we still have some bugs that we that are in the Linux kernel kernel that we also can't deal with. Don't deal with. And probably the biggest one though is there are bugs due to concurrency, and since SSQ is not a concurrent file system, we basically have nothing to say about them. Right, uh, and so. Those bugs you know, are certainly not eliminated by our proofs. Um, but anyway, the new system is generally pretty good. Uh, it's a whole class of bugs that just purely eliminate. Right? You don't have to think about it anymore. It just cannot happen. Um, so in terms of the implementation effort, uh, the total lines of code, including proofs and specifications, is about 30,000 lines of code. Uh, XV6, which is the file system basically that we try to model be equal to, uh, is actually 3,000 lines of code. And so one way to think about this is like there's a factor 10 overhead you know, for proving the file system correct um, in terms of developer time. Now, that's a little bit misleading uh, because there's quite a bit of the effort was actually in building the uh, crash horror logic infrastructure, the proof automation, on these data structures, which are all kinds of stuff that can be reused. You know, if you build another file system, you could use the same uh, libraries. And so maybe you could say, like, or at least you know, there's a 5x overhead instead of a 10x overhead if you're gentle. Another way of uh, trying to get at this question is to say, well, well, how much extra effort is it to improve the file system? So if you add a new feature, how many more, you know, how much work is it, both in terms of lines of code and uh, proving? So for example, in or originally we didn't actually have asynchronous disk I.O. Uh, we just had synchronous disk I.O. Uh, changing that to actually use asynchronous disk I.O. was about 100,000 lines of changes in the, in the logging layer. And that's both spec, proof, and uh, code. And Spec and proof is the most, you know, very little code changes. Uh, adding indirect blocks was about 1,500 lines of code to actually mm -hmm. make that work. Again, that's proof, specs, and, and the actual implementation. Adding a buffer cache was a couple hundred lines. 
you know, optimizing the log layout you know, to at least avoid one uh, thing was about 150 lives of change. So most of these changes are sort of like the, the effort is sort of incremental with the scale of the change. Uh, so to us, this suggests like if you want to make more changes, you, know, you want to make the file system better, you can do that in an incremental way and you will get a better file system. So that's sort of an encouraging uh, piece. Um, so now in terms of performance. Uh, so we read a whole bunch of file system intensive workloads. Uh, like software development workloads like Git and Make, uh, standard benchmarks that the OS community uses to measure file system performance, as well as a mail server-like type application which you know, delivers mails in user directories. Uh, and we compared them with two file systems, both non-certified. Uh, one is the XV6 file system. The reason we're doing that is because you know, we actually modeled the design of FCQ on XV6. XV6 is uh, written in C. Uh, and we also do a direct comparison link with ext4, which is the default Linux file system. But we run it in a non-standard mode. We actually run it in a synchronous mode, uh, so that every file system call uh, in Linux also commits to the disk, uh, because then it gives the same guarantees as FSQ. And we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but in the first set of slides, uh, we run it in this non-standard mode. Uh, the measurements are done on an SSD on a laptop, uh, not this laptop, but another laptop. The reason we use an SSD is because the, you know, we want to make sure that we, you know, a slow disk doesn't hide uh, you know, how slow FECQ is. Uh, so runtime, uh, so we added basically up the, you know, the runtime for all these benchmarks and then uh, compared to performance. And then the first comparison you can do is like look at FECQ and XV6. And basically, the performance is roughly similar. You know, FCQ is slightly uh, slower, and the reason it's slower is because Haskell is run slower than C. Uh, in C, we're going to like, you know, poke bits you know, in a particular block very indirectly. In Haskell, it's all a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we're paying some performance, CPU performance overhead. In terms of Linux, uh, you know, we basically, you know, one rough way to think about it is like, you know, uh, it's a factor two slower. Uh, FCQ is a factor two slower. And the reason it's a factor two slower is because the Linux file system uses a much more sophisticated logging system than actually we do. And so we're, and I will come back to that in a second, uh, too. And so that's where we lose uh, a little bit of uh, performance. But overall, I think you know the news is sort of reasonable, encouraging, uh, in the sense that you know we're, this is not ridiculous. Uh, uh, now, if you run it in the standard, you run XD4 in the standard mode, um, then actually we look ridiculous. Uh, XD4 like you know blows us out of the water, and this is not surprising, correct? Because uh, ext4 basically doesn't write to disk <laughs> at this point uh, because in <coughs> the deferred mode, you know, you're allowed to do, uh, you're allowed to do a buffer transaction in memory, and then only write then when either the file system decides it's a good time to write then, or when the application calls fsync and says like you have to force the lock to disk. Um, and so this suggests you know this opens immediately the question now could we do uh, durability too, uh, uh, deferred durability, and so we spent a lot of actually quite a bit of time working on it. Uh, and so the, 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 so the goal correct, is to actually, instead of you know, committing to a transaction directly to disk, you keep store all the transactions inside of the log uh, in memory, and when a new transaction is added, you add it to the in-memory log. And nothing really happens at that point. And at some point, you know, the application might call sync uh, or fsync, and at that point in time, you take the in-memory log and you flush it you know, to, disk, to the disk log. And then maybe at some point later, you will apply the log actually to the on-disk data structure on, on place. Right? And the advantage of this is you can flush many transactions in a single, uh, single batch. You get all kinds of write absorption. You know, if you write all different transactions, write the same block multiple times, you have to write that block only once. So there's a lot of performance advantages in doing it. The challenge from this, yeah. On right, the previous slide, what were the operations that were used? Uh, you mean, the, uh, how do you mean? The operations for, for the test. Oh, yeah, so what kinds the of operations? The, the benchmarks are uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Git, Make. Uh, it's a workload of consisting of Git, and Make, and then LFS benchmarks and uh, mail bench. Uh, and so they stress a whole bunch of different file system calls. And, and so it's an overall result, you know, not broken down by benchmark. Um, the, the problem, of course, you know, with you know, all these batching is like, how do you specify, you know, the how do you write down the specifications? Because now, let's say you're a create system call or a link system call, you add a transaction, but when you crash, you might actually crash in any of these other you know, transactions which are correspond to previous states of the file system that have nothing to do with your system call. Right? And so how do you write this down? And, and we spent quite a bit of time talking, and then of course the solution is obvious, it's very simple, so we'll, we look like idiots, but you know, it is. 
you know, the basic idea is to actually have, you know, what we call, uh, what we think about is in disk sequences, where we represent the file system as going from one disk to the next disk by, you know, transactions. So every transaction takes a, uh, the file system from one disk to the next disk in terms of logical specifications. And so each disk, of course, corresponds to a valid, you know, file system. And if you look at the disk, you know, some of them actually, these disks might be flushed. They might actually be on disk. Some of them actually might be just sitting in memory, but they haven't been flushed yet. And some of them actually might be active and actually hasn't been, you know, this transaction hasn't even committed yet. But if it is active, it actually is always inside, you know, memory, correct not on disk. Uh, and uh, so, so we use these, this, you know, this picture of disk sequences to actually write a specification. So here's, for example, the specification for inlink. And you know, you'll see actually it's very similar to actually our previous specifications. So for example, you know, the log representation is pretty similar. It says there's no transactions in progress, and there's some disk sequences that exist. Uh, and in the latest disk, in that disk sequence, there's actually a uh, valid representation of the tree that corresponds to the old tree. And then the post condition basically says, well, there's going to be a new state, which is a new disk, and we're going to add that to the disk sequence. And in that new state, you know, we have a pruned tree where the file actually is removed. And the crash condition effect is basically the same as before, is, but instead of talking about a single disk, it says like, well, we can crash with any of these, you know, any of the disk in the disk sequence. In some sense, you know, similar, you know, a little bit similar to the uh, uh, value sets that I described very early on in the talk. Uh, one thing that we thought was cool is that actually, if you look at this specification, it's actually not much more complicated than the specification I've shown you before. You know, basically we replace all the single disk basically with disk sets. Uh, and so the, the specifications still stay reasonable, simple uh, and to understand. And of course, this is crucial, right? Because if your specifications are big, then you're probably have bugs in your specification. So you want to have very concise, you know, specifications. Um, and so actually we went through and basically modified all our specifications with disk sets. We rewrote the logging system to actually support right batching. We proved, reproved the logging system, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, we rewrote the experiments. Uh, and so now we compare this modified FCQ with deferred write availability to Linux with write uh, durability. And uh, in terms of CPU performance, we still are slower. You know, the overall performance is 2x slower. But this is all CPU performance now. Uh, in terms of I.O. performance, our logging system is as sophisticated as xd 4 And we get actually the same number of disk barriers and disk writes as xd 4 So for example, if you look at Mailbench uh, and you look at SSQ Deferred, you know, we do about 4.6 barriers per logical application operation. Uh, and xd 4 does 7. So in fact, we do slightly better, uh, but there's no fundamental reason why we're actually doing better. In terms of number of disk operations, we're also about the same. And you can see the big performance improvement, right? Because FSQ was completely synchronous and was doing 40 sync, uh, sync operations, while the deferred one only does now four uh, sync operations. So that's where the factor 10 uh, improvements comes from. So I, you know, I find this usually extremely encouraging because this basically means that we can take a file system with the complexity of ext 4 the same logging system, and do equally well. Uh, it also clearly points out the important direction of research, which is mainly how to generate faster code uh, than we do so far. Uh, but if we can fix that problem, then basically we can build a file system that has the same uh, performance as ext 4 maybe less features, but at least, you know, a but, you know, the same, uh, roughly the same performance. And in fact, this file system, this implementation avoids exactly the bug that I mentioned early on in the talk. Uh, the, 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 the bug where it like, took six years for them to figure this out. Uh, because this actually, our ext 4 our security deferred file system also implements the checksum optimization and a whole bunch of other optimization. In fact, all the optimization that ext 4 implements, we implement too. Uh, and we can just prove that, you know, the bug cannot happen. Um, so direction for further future research, uh, are pretty clear what they are. Correct? Parallelism is a big one. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I'm learning, I've been reading, you know, 60s or tens of papers on concurrent verification logics. Uh, and I've asked Adam, our collaborator, like, okay, which one should we use? And he says, like, I don't know. You go figure it out. <laughs> and so we've been, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, build a uh, concurrent logic that actually fits well with file systems. Uh, a lot of the concurrent logics are basically designed to be general. Uh, and I don't want general. I want, like, a logic that works for my file system. And hopefully that can be much simpler than the general logics. And therefore, we might be able to actually prove something of the complexity of a concurrent file system correct instead of smaller programs. Uh, we want to extend this to applications. We have some simple proofs for very simple applications, but that would be cool if we can like, take the mail server, run it in FCQ, and have an end-to-end -end proof that the mail server will never lose emails. 
uh, as well as one of the goals that we want to go. And of course, you know, reduce the TCP size. Currently, Haskell is on our trusted computing base, right, because we rely on the Haskell runtime to execute our programs. Uh, so we basically assume that is correct. Uh, and we want to, of course, try to eliminate or reduce that. At a more higher level, uh, sort of stepping back a little bit further, the reason I got into this is because of security. Uh, you know, we had done quite a bit of work in uh, Linux security and found indefined behavior. And we found like you look at a very short C program, like a couple lines, and you cannot argue that that program actually is not a security bug. Uh, and so that's got, us my, got myself very excited about verification because like, okay, well, there's only one way. If you can't even look at a short program and convince yourself that it is correct, you have to prove it correct. And so this is what like sort of, this almost was like an indirect step to actually get to security in the long run. Uh, and I think, you know, basically my, my conclusion from the work that we've done so far is that the verification has, you know, turned a corner where, you know, the technology is ready to be used, you know, maybe a little bit awkward to use, but it's ready to be used in like real systems. And you can build actually, you know, complex systems using it, prove them correct, and which is super exciting. And like a long term, it would be great if we could like prove an application of this form correct, right? Like, could we build a messaging system, you know, where I send a message, or Alice send a message to Bob, and it's guaranteed that Bob, you know, basically uh, can prove that actually it actually came from Alice's phone, uh, end to end, you know, whether they're key loggers or whatever, you know, you can totally prove that uh, actually is possible. It'd be cool if you could prove that. Right? And clearly, we're very, very far away from doing any, you know, big statements of that kind of you know, strong properties, right? because we just don't really build, I know how to build secure systems, period, I think, of any complexity. Uh, and so it would be cool if we could do this. And I think, you know, the verification technology is, uh, will help us do getting there. Of course, it can't be just verification uh, because, you know, you don't want to verify all the code. I mean, like that's in, you know, impractical. And so you have to have very good isolation story about, like, you know, how you can sort of separate unverified code from verified code. Uh, and, you know, there's, I think, lots of interesting uh, things to do. Uh, as well as, you know, there's interesting, you know, if you're going to build an application this scope, you probably want to do, use different uh, certification technology. You want to use crash horror logic and some distributed systems, you know, type uh, technology. And how do you combine them together in sort of a single system? I think is a very interesting and open uh, research question. And finally, but actually, uh, a question that fascinates me is like, how do you do software updates in a context like this? Because like, you know, if you, once you prove your file system correct, you want to update it once in a while, and, and you want to update it in a way that it actually still maintains the specifications, correct? And how, how, how to deal with that problem? That seems another interesting. Uh, an interesting problem. Okay, uh, so the short note, the short point here is like there's a big opportunity, I think, you know, to address secu fundamental security problems now. You know, verification has gotten so, so that has been so good. So in conclusion, uh, I you know, told you a little bit about this file system project, uh, which has two components: this crash or logic uh, to reason about crashes, and then the, the first verified file system that actually has proven me to be uh, crash safe. I think you know this whole verification, as I said, has turned the corner, and it's an interesting technology that you, you can now use as a hammer in other projects. And I think there's a huge amount of interesting problems in the sort of uh, intersection of verification and systems. Uh, and I expect that there will be a lot of cool results in the next you know, couple, five, ten years, you know, from you know, lots of people. So if you want to get into this, now's the right time. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And, uh, Yeah, if you have any questions on any topic, feel free to ask. <laughs> so given a lot of the specifications you write, I'm wondering to, to what degree the, the implementation code can be automatically synthesized? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So the, so the approach we're going to take uh, for code generation, actually, is to synthesize the, the, the actual code. Uh, uh, and, uh, I think that's the right place to uh, use it. The problem, because the I think you know our specifications are pretty uh, like you know our pre-post and conditions are pretty general, so it's pretty hard to see how you generate code from those. But I think right. on a lower level, like for our uh, lower level function, we should be able to generate. You can do the sketching, for example. Yes, and we are going to see sort of the use of specification as sort of a sketching framework and generate code from that. Uh, that's exactly what we do. Like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work that Adam Chapala and Clements have done. Yeah. They have a code generation project, and we're going to use those techniques to apply them in the context of the file system. In the context of file system, what's really important is, uh, is to be able to sort of do the bit twiddling, where you can actually take a block and then uh, point a bit. And, uh, so we have to prove that like, you know, updating the bit directly is equivalent to sort of unmarshalling the block, you know, sending the bit, marshalling the block back, and writing it out. And so I think, there's, yeah, I think this is the way we're going to take to actually get that code and get rid of Haskell. Yeah? 
So uh, how does this, uh, your effort uh, uh, jive with SEL4? Uh, complimentary. Uh, you Would know, you see them uh, in a happy marriage at one Yeah, time? yeah, why not? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, uh, SEL4, it would, would be good to have a file system, right? They don't have a file system. Right, they don't have a file system. Exactly, so you know, you could be in, uh, so you can imagine like running this file system on top of the cell four kernel, and you know maybe in the long run prove some end-to-end -end properties. Now this would require that you know you figure out a way of marrying the verification technology that yeah. cell four used with uh, with us, which is like I, I think was a really interesting problem in general. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be great. If we want end-to-end -end system security, that we that would be the way to go. I don't think that's going to happen any you know in the next couple of months. You know, it's a multi-year you know, thing to do, but yeah. So just to follow that question, so uh, so let's say SCL4 was the microkernel, and now there's a file system. So I know you said that this is like uh, pretty much verification is uh, applicable to actual systems. But how far are we to be able to verify like a full operating system? Something like a Linux kernel with a lot of device travel, well, a I lot of components. Yeah, I think Linux kernel is out of scope. Uh, and I think also the wrong way to think about it. I think the way you want to think about it is like how to split up the Linux kernel into pieces that actually are can be untrusted and pieces that can be trusted and then figure out how to verify it. I actually think actually even that is the wrong view. The right view is to think about it in terms of the application. Like, and we, uh, when, what is the TCP in the application? And the ideal uh, way to set it up is actually to s arrange it that the kernel actually is not part of the TCP. And I think this is not, at least the systems community, the OS community always thinks, wow, the kernel is part of the TCP because that's our business. Uh, but I think actually the right way to think about it is from the application point of view and actually figure out, like, for example, you have an SSH agent. The thing that is the TCP is the SSH process that holds your keys. Right? And the rest of that should not be, you know, and that's the piece that needs to be verified. And the rest of everything else should be, you know, hopefully, you know, we've got to figure out a way to design systems that everything else is basically outside of the TCP. And I don't think we actually know how to do that. I think that's a great from there and I would love to work on it. I'm planning to work on it. Yeah, go ahead. Two questions. Um, one of them, you used Haskell yeah. to translate down to Haskell. Is that because of the declarative nature? No, uh, because of Cox supports two backends. Uh, one is ha ha Haskell and one is OCaml. We started with OCaml, but there was a bug in the, uh, in the extractor, so we switched to Haskell. And then, uh, then people said, and then later, recently, we tried ha OCaml again. It was no faster. It was basically a slower effort than the Haskell one. And that's the only reason. So because no, of the framework thing. Yeah, so it's with COC. It's basically because we use COC, you know, you just okay. And I think when, as earlier, we're going to go to another, we're going to do our own extraction. And then we hopefully get much better performance. Can you prove it to the correct two? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah, it would be a synthesis type of extraction where yeah. basically every step of the synthesis actually will prove as a side effect that the synthesis is correct. Yeah. So the second question is have you tried doing this in a networked file system setting? No, no, yeah. Mean, the transactional semantics of the nature should carry over, yep. but um, performance-wise, or like, what does crash really mean? There, crash of that remote yeah. so the, 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 system, the, the, crash of this yeah. one. Yeah. So the the people at Microsoft, uh, the Iron uh, Fleet yeah. project, has looked at a little bit, has looked at the distributed key value store and actually how to build that. Um, uh, and but they basically assume that the individual nodes are crash safe. And so one way you can think about it is that you can marry this with you know, Iron Fleet, and then you might be able to talk about end-to-end -end some set of distributed applications. Uh, I mean, there, I also think there's a huge open area uh, for the research. I mean, basically, there's only one sort of verified uh, distributed key value store, which is this Iron Fleet thing. Uh, everything else uh, you know, is either TLA-based, but that's not really end-to-end you know, -end, you know, uh, verification. Right? I mean, that's basically arguing about the correctness of protocols. And so I think that's another rich area of uh, interesting uh, work we explore. Um, and so I'm also, you know, have some ideas about how to go there. Uh, Before that, you do multi-core thing, right? So single node, multi-core. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're, uh, I, I don't know. And, uh, the concurrency is hard. Uh, and we have to, you know, distributed systems also requires that we do something about concurrency. Uh, right. but, uh, I've been working, for, uh, well, with Tej and Nikolai and Adam and I have been you know, working on concurrency for a year now, and we've done three, four different things. They all failed miserably. Uh, and uh, now working on another approach, and maybe that will work better. Uh, and, I, 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 and that approach is basically is back to one of the first ideas that we have, which is basically only work on I.O. concurrency and not on processor concurrency. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is, like, when you miss in the cache, we want to run another system call. And, 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 and not even worry about running multiple system calls at the same time. Right? Like, so this would be unicore uh, with you know, parallelism for concurrency for I.O. Uh, uh, because 
see so that we can make that work. Uh, the real issue is like the specifications get so complicated uh, very quickly. And, and I don't know how much you know about verification logic, concurrent logic, but like anything like you know, the release guarantee style logics are very uh, you know, basically exploding in your face if you start writing specifications. Uh, concurrent separation logic doesn't capture you know, relationships between different states, and so it actually doesn't really allow you to move end to end properties. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, you know, I'm slightly here out of my depth here, correct? Because I'm not a verification <coughs> person, you know, but like my read of, like, you know, and we haven't found the right thing yet. And Adam can point us to, you should do this, and it's, you know, we have to figure it out. Yeah, great. You put uh, just metadata through the logs, or is it data also? Ah, so that's a good, uh, so in the, the first FCCQ file system that I described earlier on, everything goes through the log, including data and metadata. In the second one where we talked, uh, the, the, the one that actually with the disk sequences, we also implement the file optimization that Linux does, where you can specify whether you want to have bypass the log for direct writes or not. And so we have a file system, you know, the, the second FSQ does have bypass of the log for direct writes to blocks. And implements F data sync, and we have specification for F data sync, et cetera. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.